What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Business and Travel Podcast. My name is Jackson Dean, and today we've got another really, really good guest uh, and a really, really good episode. Um, This one has got some seriously good information in it. If you are looking to ever raise money or or value your company, this is a, a legal approach uh, to what you should be going through if you're ever looking to do something like that and all the different steps that you have to go through when uh, sort of structuring a business from the beginning and, and sort of having that exit orientated mindset. So before we get into it and before I introduce our next guest, I just wanted to have a quick chat about what I've been doing here behind the scenes while still getting this uh, episode put together for you guys. Um, It is just a small group of you out there that are listening in and I haven't done any promotion behind it, but it's really just been a challenge uh, for me to try and be uh, consistent and get one of these episodes out each day. I mean, just in the last week alone, we uh, ran one of our Instagram marketing workshops for about 40 business owners here on the Gold Coast here in Australia. And then a few days later, I was speaking in front of about 130 businesses, uh, all on digital marketing, and then I had a lot of follow-up calls after that as well. So I've been extremely busy uh, working around the clock, and this uh, episode is still going out. I have committed to getting this out every single week. It's definitely been a lot more challenging than I anticipated running a full podcast. It's almost like running a business, honestly, by itself. But I've got a really, really great team behind it. Uh, A big shout out to Dave, our audio engineer, who's getting these out and helping me do a lot of the uh, heavy lifting. Again, thanks, Dave, for putting these together and uh, keeping the ball rolling and keeping the momentum up. It is quite humbling knowing that there's a few hundred of you out there listening in. So I feel like I have this obligation now to fulfill my end of the agreement and get these rock solid episodes out. And on the topic of that, let me introduce our next guest. His name is Nimrod Vroman. He is a partner of Yigel Arnon and Co., which is an Israeli legal firm. It was established nearly 60 years ago now. And it is one of the largest law firms in Israel. They've got offices in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem and over 170 lawyers uh, working for them, of whom uh, 61 of them are partners. So this is a big, big company over there in Israel, and they help a lot in the tech sector, especially in the VC sector, I should say uh, the venture capital sector. So They do a lot of investing. They do a lot of um, teaching as well. Or Nimrod's um, blessed us with a lot of teaching here today on on how we should be structuring our companies for exit. We go through a lot of different stuff. The uh, some of the core things that we're going to talk about are pre money valuations, um, how to actually value your startup, what sort of legal documents you should be careful with when you're actually structuring your startup. So some really, really important tips in here for everybody to consider. Nimrod, he he talks about his background and his career um, and how he's had this uh, career in both Israel and Australia. So you'll learn about that. Uh, This episode, by the way, is actually a two-part episode. So we're going to extend this over two parts just because there's so much information in his actual message that he delivered at this workshop over in Tel Aviv for our group that was uh, that was flown over to Tel Aviv to sort of explore the Israeli uh, tech ecosystem. And uh, he talks about uh, one of the companies that he started called You Tell Me. He was one of the first people with this crowdsourced feedback type idea. It's a very similar idea to Fiverr, if anyone's ever used that. Fiverr is about a $500 million company. And funnily enough, it, uh, Square Peg Capital actually invested in that company. Uh, And Dan Krasnostein, who was one of the partners of Square Peg Capital, was on our last episode, who gave us some really good knowledge bombs on just, again, the same type of a conversation from just, just, just from a different perspective on, you know, how to value your startup, what you should be looking as far as an exchange of equity for money, and all these uh, other cool things that we talked about in that last episode. If you haven't listen to that one. Make sure you check it out. Um, it's with Dan Krasnerstein, the partner of Square Peg Capital. 
But essentially, we go through a, a bit of a different approach or perspective on investing and um, raising money because Nimrod's got that that legal background and, and his uh, company that is behind him. He sort of gives us the ins and outs of how uh, companies that are sort of got that VC fund approach, but even if it's a legal company like Yago, Arnon and Co, what their approach is for sort of analyzing startups and, and then how they actually invest in, in the end. So some really, really good tips in here for pretty much anybody. A lot of this information was also new to me when we were over there. So I got a lot out of this. I hope you guys get as much out of it as well. I really uh, want to say a thank you to uh, a few of the people that are in contact with us a lot uh, with feedback about these episodes. I'm um, quite humbled that uh, it is helping uh, a lot of you guys out there. And that's the motivation behind me continuing to put these out. It really is uh, a lot harder than I thought it was going to be just getting a consistent episode flow out. But there's a lot that goes into it, guys. So I do appreciate the feedback and um, I do appreciate that you guys are asking questions and engaging with this. So we're only at these early stages. I'm really just providing these episodes for those people that are sort of under the radar and tuning into this before um, I really start advertising or promoting this podcast too much. You guys are getting to hear all of this, you know, information first. And from my perspective, some of the stuff that is on here, there are degrees worth of information in here if you're looking and interested in in running a business. So um, I'm glad it is helping and uh, I would encourage you guys to keep uh, keep up the communication. Um, you can find me or send us a message on my website, uh, jacksondean.com.au. Uh, you can also find these podcast episodes there if you'd like to leave a review. Uh, head over to jacksondean.com.au and it's all there for you to um, to look through. You can watch it straight off the website. Obviously, if you're listening to this now, you, you're listening to it on either Apple or Android. Uh, we've got all the different audio platforms set up. We've finally been approved for Spotify, which is a big deal too. So we've got a full show on Spotify now. Really, really cool that we're getting on all these platforms. But without any further ado, guys, I'm going to get into this episode with Nimron Vroman, who's uh, the partner of Yigel Arnon and Co. And he has got some really, really good information for us today on raising money going through pre-money valuations, how to value your startup, and what sort of documents you should be careful with when starting a startup. So enjoy the episode, guys, and I will talk to you soon. So um, I'll start by introducing myself, then we'll talk about the scenic route to funding or fundability, which is not an academic lecture at all. I think you can get the academic stuff elsewhere. Um, first of all, welcome to Israel. I feel like we need to apologize for the weather. Uh, really, honestly, the other 51 weeks are... are <laughs> um, but you should get like a break tomorrow, probably, and then Thursday's going to be shooting again. Israel is a startup nation in the sense that it generates thousands of companies, uh, more per capita than any other place in the world more patents per capita than any other place in the world, more Nasdaq-traded companies than any other place except the U.S. and Canada, and slowly China is overtaking, blah, blah, blah. The fact of the matter is that it's a very exit-orientated country in the sense that a lot of these companies have comparatively or globally low aspirations. They actually just want to sell out very quickly. They might tell you that they want to make a, to, you know, create billion-dollar companies, but yeah, some when do. we do, when some do, but when we do finally exit, the average exit in Israel is fifty to sixty million, which makes everybody rich. It's a life-changing event, but it's not huge. And uh, we do have a lot of big companies, but society here this is not critical. The society here, it's just a, there's a temporary sense of existence here. It's like we got to make our dough and get out. There's also something more optimistic about Israel's view of the world. Israel, I think, Israelis view the world more globally. They don't see themselves as the only target market that they can achieve. They, they see themselves as providing a product for the entire planet. Uh, and when I say the entire planet, it means that Israeli companies will very quickly use resellers to also sell in our enemy countries. So, and this is something, these are differences to Australia, and I kind of know Australia a little bit, you'll 
I'll explain why in a moment. But Aussie entrepreneurs have the luxury of thinking about building a big company. Australia has been around for enough time and can support it. And they also have the luxury of viewing Australia as a legitimate market, albeit not so big, but it's big enough to sustain a company and, and, and have them get a salary, etc. And they've got this kind of back door to Asia Pacific and they can maybe sell there. So they, they, they don't see the sellout. The early exit is less in the vocabulary. But when a startup industry evolves, i.e. when venture capital money comes in, the venture capital funds drive exit orientation because they have a life cycle. They, they exist for about eight years. And after eight years, they want to see liquid cash. And if you don't have in this market secondary buyers, people who are willing to buy from shareholders, then you need to sell the company or you'll be pressured to do so anyway. But what I'm trying to show you here is in Hebrew is just a few recent exits that we've had is the sale of Waze that we all use or most some of us use to Google for 1.3 billion. This series, this TV series, does anyone here know Silicon Valley? The series, TV <laughs> yes. series. So that's like about founders or bringing their company. This series is about four people. It starts with four people who are not unlike the Silicon Valley founders as they sell their company for 400 million and what they do after. Uh, so again, it's this kind of um, heralding of post-exit entrepreneurs as opposed to entrepreneurs who built big companies. And then you've got one company that stands out. It's Checkpoint that's been public on the NASDAQ from, from 1993. Big company hires thousands of employees all over the world, and, uh, and that's the standout. Personally, I uh, grew up in Australia. I lived there for seven years. My father was there um, trying to get rich Jews to bring money to Israel to donate it. <laughs> uh, he was relatively successful. Um, today, I go to Australia to try to get rich Jews to invest in Israel. <laughs> um, but uh, this is all cynical, but it's also just true. <laughs> And uh, I grew up there. I'm a big Essendon supporter. And uh, had a good, finally a good year last year. And then they took, and then did they, did they take like Bomber Thompson for like doing yeah, drugs or drugs. something? Yeah. Is that, are they all just doing drugs all the time? Is that the thing of this team? Yeah. All right. So, um, and I thought that was like Collingwood's thing, but then. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I grew up there. I came back here to serve in the military. I uh, served in a drone unit which is a technology unit. The, everybody will tell you here that when why is this the startup nation? One of the reasons is the military. The military spawns people who know how to deal with technology and then they create companies afterwards. And then there's something when people here are like over self-appreciative or Zionistic, they'll tell you, that it, they tell you that one of the reasons is the military. And then you're like, well, what are we supposed to do with that when we go to Australia? We're not going to re-enlist people in a compulsory service. There's no Vietnam War going on. So the thing is that actually there is a takeaway from that. The takeaway is not serving in an institution that has an existential threat that it has to deal with and therefore develop technologies. There are things in the structure of the Israeli military that are unique that you can actually implement in your companies in Australia. But the Israeli military is based on primarily on people doing reserves duty. So when I finish my three-year service, I do another two years' worth of service for the rest of my life, showing up for approximately one month every year to do reserves duty, which is the big deal, really. Losing the years 18 to 21 is one thing. I could have lost them just being drunk and stoned the whole time. If I lost them in the army, it's the same thing. But... <laughs> uh, but but losing losing a month every year during my adult life, uh, when I'm also supposed to have you know, like parenting obligations and obligations towards my clients, that's the big thing in Israel. That's the big deal. Like Mike in the back here, he literally disappear for month disappears for weeks on end, and certainly a month or more a year, actually risking his life at some border post. I don't do that anymore. I've been pretty much kicked out or relegated to office jobs in my unit, but. He still does, and he's got a baby and shit, and it'll be, it'll be crappy to lose him for a month when that happens, but it will happen. And then there's an interesting thing in the dynamic when we do show up to reserve duty. So when Mike will show up to reserve duty, or when I show up to reserve duty to play my miniature role in the cabin, I'm no longer a 
18 year old NCO taking orders from the officers and then just doing whatever they say. I'm 35 years old. Now the officers may be still in their compulsory service. They may not be reserved. They may still be between the ages of 21. And what that spawns is an anti-hierarchical dynamic in the most hierarchical organization possible. Like the type of organization where in the rest of the world, you literally get shot for disobeying your, your commanders. In the Israeli army, it is totally cool to procrastinate on an order for a while, to hesitate, to challenge it, to say, what the F? Are you serious? We're not doing that. That's the sort of dynamic that is an Israeli unit across the board. And when you implement that in a tech organization, you've got your R&D team actually doing R&D and not just implementing the whims of one VP, right? So if you encourage disobedience or structured disobedience, you're generating innovation in your company. And even a startup needs innovation all the time from all of its personnel. It can't just be execution, execution, execution of one person's ideas. And this has business cases like the Intel Core 2 Duo that prevents the overheating of our computers, among other things, is the result of Intel's R&D team in Israel just saying to management over and over again that Moore law is something that cannot be complied with over the years and has to be halted somehow and something else has to be developed and they just popped up with this and they said this is what we need to do and it was ultimately developed. There are many, many other examples. I represented a company for eight years called Rounds. It was acquired by Kick Interactive in, in Canada to do its stuff, which is just video inside their messenger, just video chatting inside their messenger. And they quickly convinced this billion dollar company that they actually need to do an ICO and are the biggest ICO, $100 million ICO for a funded for a VC funded company. So these are things that are spawned from the stupid R&D team that was bought to do video in Israel. Um, and you know, I just wanted to ask you, so, yeah. so the military has this sort of unique uh, dynamic around <clears throat> encouraging, like encouraging like structured disobedience, mm -hmm. sort of say. And then hence that sort of transferable in that tech startup environment. Yeah. How is that, um, is that sort of transferred into like your more traditional industry? Is like banking, finance, yes. law? It's what does that look like? How does that it's happen? absolutely everywhere in our... Um, in our industry, Mike is a junior associate uh, in our in our firm. He's been around for a year and a half, but I think that our relationship is completely eye level. He doesn't just do what I tell him to do. There's always a dynamic of challenging, you know, challenging authority. Now, granted, that could halt in the long term the um, structuring of very large organizations yeah, yeah. that rely on hierarchy, but. When you're exit orientated and what you need is to generate uh, exponential innovation at high volumes, then it's actually good. It's good, right? So because then it, it creates that early exit. But it's, it's, there's, there's a discourse all the time. There's like, what's the right balance, okay? You don't want to become too rigid. But a lot of the big companies in the world that make an acquisition here actually acquire, they used to acquire uh, R&D centers. They now don't even call the acquihires Acquihires for R&D centers, they call them, uh, we're creating a center of excellence in Israel. Mm -hmm. So Center of excellence. Yeah, center excellence, yeah. center of excellence. And then they just let the Israelis do the thing, and they come up with ideas, and <laughs> most of them they trash, and they, they don't, it's too, it's too small for, their, for the size of their company for them to even care, but sometimes it generates miracles. And the excellence, are they mostly um, American, like U.S. companies? That do so that's the amazing thing. Yeah. Historically, it's the four horsemen, or the five horsemen, it's... Intel, Apple, uh, recently Facebook, Google, right? Um, today, like I said, Kik is a billion-dollar private company that's raised only $50 million in the last uh, three to four years, and it's made an acquisition to create a center of excellence in Israel. It's a Canadian company. Yeah. It's not even you. You look at it, a lot of Chinese companies are doing this, a lot of them, like not, not, not just a small view. There's... And there's also, Everywhere. there's also a new thing of like Israeli companies grown and are buying Israeli startups. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It also is recently happening. I encourage like, I encourage also you guys to look at it. It's cheaper to hire developers here. It's there, there is, oh, yeah. There's more of an abundance of them. They're interested in doing interesting things. Uh, Amazon is now coming here to trump the whole industry. I told them about the, 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 the Amazon discussion. Yeah. 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 
That's interesting. That's definitely worth discussing. Um, what else? So basically, there. after the army, uh, I tried to open a dog washing business here. <laughs> That's what happens to all of Israelis, by the way. We all need to lose our hair at some point, you know. Because yes, after the, the army, uh, it's fair. like another act of disobedience. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it, is, was, it, is, it, it was a failing. Uh, you don't want to see my photo you know, after the army. You're very bad. <laughs> so failed miserably on this venture. Um, the car was ruined at all. It was I like, copied something that was going on in Australia. Mm-hmm. I then incorporated a company with my best friend during my law and business management degree. The company was called You Tell Me. It's the best company of all time. <laughs> it's uh, a platform for copyright trading. Um, you can basically ask questions like uh, I want a slogan, URL, tagline, motto, etc. for my business. And then the question would be dispersed among Facebook users through a dedicated Facebook app. It's the first Facebook app that did this, except there wasn't like a game like Farmville. Yeah. Um, but it couldn't be dispersed in mobile phones because it was 2007. It was not unlike Fiverr and not unlike 99designs. Mm-hmm. 99designs has survived and is a legit company. Mm-hmm. Fiverr is a $500 million company mm-hmm. and one of the biggest investments from Australia in Israel, by the way, through a fund in Australia called Square Peg Capital. Yep. And you tell me it had to close, even though it was first. We couldn't have <laughs> money. Were you just too early? Uh, we, well, we were too early. We were too young. The founders were too young. The team wasn't a strong enough team. We'll get to that in a moment. Um, and uh, it was too close to the financial crisis and yeah. had too many risk factors. When you incorporate a marketplace startup mm-hmm. post-financial crisis, it's too difficult because yeah. the investors have two risks. They, they don't know if you'll get the people, they don't know if you'll get the buyers, and they don't know if you'll get the sellers. Mm-hmm. You know, if you only have to get buyers or only have to get sellers, it's one thing. But if, you're bring, if you have a chicken and egg things, yeah. after a financial crisis, nobody wants to invest yeah. in you. And, that, and plus, we weren't worth it. My co-founder, however... Uh, was also my best friend. He took on two developers. He said, stuff taking a, a guy with a law degree. <laughs> and uh, I went to work at Yigal Arnon, the law firm where I work in today and have been for the past 10 years. So I represented him and like basically tried my skills on his terms of service, founders agreement, NDAs. I made every single possible mistake that I would, uh, I, I would laugh at today or even panic at today. <laughs> and he still sold his company if, to Yahoo in a very successful exit and within three and a half years and now manages Yahoo Israel and has recently be appointed, been appointed to manage Verizon Israel, wow. i.e. the offices of AOL and Yahoo in Israel. Three and a half years. This, in three and a half years, sold this company and within three years is now managing the entire site of Verizon, which is a $220 billion yeah. company in Israel. By the way, an um, example of another guy who just gives <coughs> office hours feedback for free. Never, I've never heard of him asking money for sitting with an entrepreneur and coffee for 30 minutes. Yeah, it's extremely successful. Sorry, what did the you tell me? You tell me you want a cool name for your company. You feel like everything is good, but your name isn't good. You say, I'm willing to pay $20 for this name rather than hire a branding firm and pay 500 bucks. You pay us 20 bucks in advance. We keep two. And then we say, this is the problem. Users from all over the internet will answer your question and the winner will get 18 bucks. By the way, if you paid a thousand bucks, our algorithm will send the question only to verified copywriters, blah, blah, blah. So the more money you pay, the better the solution providers are. So like crowdsource creativity. Crowdsource creativity, which has like the more money you pay. It's like Uber. If you're in a rush hour, you pay more, you get the car faster or whatever. You know what I'm saying? We never got that far in development. It was all on paper. We had like the side that was working. It was a good, I think it's still good, actually. It is there. The company is now really succeeding. succeeding. It's like quickest track. Yeah, it's really. I actually believe that our implementation was best because 99designs requires the creator to work for the solution, to create like a logo, etc. Ours is a Spark based solution that even boring people can come up with. Right, so even me as a lawyer or an accountant, to have a bathroom break, I could I could think of just do it for Nike. I could do that. <laughs> it could happen. Bucks. Yeah, yeah. yeah could, uh, exactly. And then if I win that, I'll get a thousand bucks for the next project. So there's less work in that, and you kind of get more like a game. It's more it's game. As as just a side note, I actually have solved most of my problems. The most creative time and yeah. like do all my design and everything through crowdsource feedback. Like, that's yeah. naturally where my mind goes if I want to do some of that. So that I would have used a lot. Yeah, look, you know what? This discussion is always like, 
partially nostalgic for me, partially yeah. rubbing salt on my wounds. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of things. So it's, it's get into other things soon. We'll go, go back to you tell me in a bit. So this is just for Australians who watch this presentation. This is me with Dipper. We played in this <laughs> thing called the Peace Team. Uh, we played in the AFL World Cup in 2011. Mm, we were there for a month. Uh, it's a team comprised of half Palestinians, half Israelis. So don't believe what they tell you. We totally try to get along. And uh, it was a very successful tournament. We even beat China and India. Um, <laughs> and we got thumped by everyone else. <laughs> uh, but uh, it was a very cool experience. And I got to see Dipper Naked, which is something that I don't wish for <laughs> my enemies. <laughs> um, so that's that. You only, you only show that slide to Aussies, right? Only to Aussies. Nobody <laughs> else is <understands. laughs> Then I have to start to explain what food it is and maybe don't get it. It's like fucking everyone. <laughs> um, so the, now the, the purpose of this presentation, after um, Clarity Ray, my friend's company, was sold, it was actually there's a good there's a kind of a swamp effect in our um, industry where everybody knows, everybody hears about great success stories. And then I became the lawyer who, you know, struck gold on, a, on his first company. And I had a couple of companies that came to me from the military service that wanted to do some cool things with drones. And they got this great media hype because it's so cool to do things with drones. They got they raised so much money. So, my, like, my first three companies, one of them got sold. The other two reached $200 million valuations in their respective fields, hire a lot of employees to, to date. And then just more and more founders came, and I was lucky enough to, based on my best friend's work and people from the army, to build a, a very successful practice at a very successful firm. So like me, there are another five partners in our department, and there are another two departments that do tech. We have 60 lawyers out of 180 that do tech only, uh, and 180 is very big in Israel. It's like one of the top six or seven. And within this practice, like my personal one has just grown very quickly while I was still young because of the first three companies. So for 10 years, I've been collecting this information about the companies and trying to, trying to think about what makes them successful. Now, this thinking about what makes a company, a young company successful is actually essential to our practice because in Israel, we take startup companies before they raise their first dollar and we defer their legal fees until they raise money. And if they don't raise money, we do not charge them any legal fees, which means that statistically speaking, we bet between 15 to $25,000 on every single company that we take. If it will not raise money, we will write off between fifteen dollars to $25,000 of work. Um, so, so is it common to take equity as a no, lawyer out here? No, the, firm the lawyers fees, who so. take equity are, are using your fear of paying. They're not supposed to take equity. Okay, sure. So it's deferment of payment? It's deferment of payment. The only catch is that if you do get to a point where you're paying and you have deferred fees of 20, I will bill you 25 as a one-off. And I'll take the five to fund the ones who died. And I have to get an 80% strike rate to make sure that I'm covering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I need to find companies that will fund with at an 80% for funding, not for success. But for funding. For funding. It's still good. So it, it's, it's definitely good. It's definitely better than the general stat. And then, I, then you try to create a checklist. Because, you know, in the beginning, it's cool. You're betting and uh, you've got three companies and there's no point. But now I've got... $750,000 in deferred fees at any point in time. It's and it's constantly growing. So I got to know statistically what of this is going to come in and what I'm going to write off uh, to know if the practice as a whole is uh, profitable. So I've started to try to, I guess, compile a list of criteria, a criteria list of, of things that make a company fundable. Okay? And that's the purpose of this talk is to try to tell you what I think the company needs to be funded. Now, does anybody have the same approach as you out here, like most lawyers? Or is uh, very unique a lot of the lawyers the will defer fees to compete with our firm's practice. Right. Yeah. Um, I don't think they do it uh, knowing what companies to select. Yeah. I think we have an edge. Yeah. Because a lot of the tech firms in Israel that lead in tech, lead in tech because they had used very old and successful U.S. partners mm -hmm. to bring in very big uh, U.S. clients that will work on the acquirer or investor side. Our firm has a very strong co company base. We represent literally thousands of startup companies. We also have a couple of old U.S. partners. One of them represented Intel in the acquisition of Mobileye for 15.3 billion, which is Israel's biggest tech exit. 
And we do represent all of the funds here at one point in time, but our practice mainly focuses on companies. So our ability to assess, I think, as a whole is better than our competition. Obviously, our competition will slum it if we are. They will try to do the same thing, but I don't think they have as good a strike rate. And they try to solve their problems by throwing very young and inexperienced bodies at clients and having the partners disappear. When I take on a client, I know that I'm going to be the front for the first few months. Yeah. I bring in, we bring in the juniors actually a little bit later in the game because when the company's funded, they hire someone to work with the juniors and then you have a structure. But when the founders are like, every move that the founders make, every NDA that they sign yeah. is the most critical thing the company did yeah. up until that point in time. So to say this NDA is an NDA, therefore it's not critical, therefore I'll let the intern do it, is actually negligent yeah, yeah. because for that company it's like a baby mm-hmm. right the baby the first like roll around that the baby does the most important thing it might fall off the cupboard and uh, yeah. 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 That's that's yeah. so the approach that other law firms take is a cost-cutting approach because they know they're betting yeah. and we're saying no we're taking a investment approach yeah. and uh, yeah, and it's structured this, yeah this is so important because I, I think from uh, my work with the OC companies again the whole global mindset what do you do now? You're now starting a company. The first thing you do, the founders agree, you know, the first yeah. NDA. Yeah. If in five years Microsoft is going to want to buy you, they're going to look at that. Yeah. You know, you want to look at those things you sign. Like that can really make a huge effect on your future of a company yep. you don't know. And that's why it's important to have lawyers. It's important like, to have someone to actually talk to. Yeah. And that, by the way, this is not a marketing ploy. It's not a sales presentation. Yeah. It's something we're actually yeah. doing. Yeah. We understand that founders around the world not in the valley founders around the world in other uh, up-and-coming startup nations like sydney melbourne yeah. london singapore hong kong paris berlin mm-hmm. uh, they don't have the law firms are not sophisticated around that so we're saying we will do the same thing we do with israeli companies we'll do it for you if you want to call us we will open a tab for you and we will charge you whatever when you raise money and if you don't raise money we won't charge you we want to have the same conversations that we have with entrepreneurs in Israel. We want to have them with entrepreneurs abroad because we learn more about our, with the more data points we have, the better our system is. So what I'm essentially telling you is that, you know, call me and, it'll, and, and again, it will not be, first of all, our rates are far lower. And secondly, we will charge only when you raise money and we won't charge if you don't. Subject to me clearing the criteria that I'm going to talk about in a moment. Um, so a company raises money. Uh, a company has essentially three stages to its development. Idea phase, incorporation is semantics. I advise to incorporate as close as possible to the idea phase um, for different reasons. Um, investment, then you do another investment, another investment. You've got some sales here to clients or usage by consumers, and then you have an exit. Throughout the entire process, the founders view the company through one paradigm, paradigm of product development, marketing, business development, hiring, etc., uh, accountants view the company through a different paradigm, the paradigm of financial statements. They see financial statements evolve, and lawyers see contracts. They see a founder's agreement here. They see more basic documents of incorporation here. When an investor joins, they see a share purchase agreement, amended broad articles of association, a longer shareholder's agreement, side letters granting some investors other rights. It all gets very complicated, and the lawyer's job is to make sense of all the documents. Um, whereas you continue to see product development. We're going to talk about what investors see. Yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and then there's an exit or liquidation. Um, the financing process, when you raise money, also can be broken down into phases. The first stage is a good meeting. Now, there could be several good meetings. Usually are. Then there's a term sheet. If you're working with investors, strive to get to a term sheet. Strive to get to something in writing that summarizes the terms of the proposed investment. Uh, until you get to that point, you're still in the first stage of this process, and it really doesn't matter where you are in that stage if you haven't yet arrived at the term sheet. It means you're doing nothing. How do you advise startups that are pretty money about valuation? Yeah, we'll get to that in, uh, okay. in a bit. Actually, no, we won't get to it, so I'll answer it now. The first question you have to ask yourself as an entrepreneur is how much money you need. The answer to that question needs to be based on what you can achieve with what amounts of money. You can say, I need $1.8 million to develop my product, get an MVP out there. I heard heard Israeli entrepreneurs already add 
terms to terms. So MVP is cool, but I found another founder of mine that I admire a lot said, I, I like MRS, most reasonable stab. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, maybe the stabbing is again Israeli related. <laughs> so so what's your what's your most reasonable stab? And then <laughs> how many people do you need to conduct a normal QA if it's a B2C or how many businesses do you need as clients if it's B2B? To actually validate your product and create something that's useful for uh, for scaling mm-hmm. that's pretty much the latest phase right mm-hmm. that your valuation can be ready for the next round of financing so that you want maybe 1.8 right mm-hmm. but you should know that with 300k you've got your MVP mm-hmm. so theoretically you don't have to say no to an angel that's offering you 300k you just have to understand that it's a different finance so understand the amount of money that you need to get to the Horizon, your horizon is pretty much your users using your product and it getting well baked for the next phase. You can't see beyond that. You can't purport to see beyond that. And then break it down until then and see what amounts of money take you to that point so that you can also raise partial financings from people. Because sometimes you're talking to someone and you talk to them about the need for $2.6 million, but that person literally only has $400. So either you don't have anything to talk about until you can get a group together or you can talk to that person about 400k in an educated manner as like a set as like a mini round and where that will get you okay okay so once you've decided how much money you need then you have to think about what sort of dilution you're willing to accept okay because if you're raising 2.6 million it's a lot of it's everything you need but but you don't want to be diluted by 50 percent the founders need to need to end the company's life cycle with about 10 to 15 percent each in a two to three person company 10, 15, 15. yeah yeah in a two to three person company so you don't want to be diluted by more than 35 percent in around the financing by the investor that's like the max that makes sense otherwise the investor is t- the company is tainted by control issues so if you know that you know that being diluted by 30 by more than 35 percent and this person is offering you the full amount that you're willing to raise and Then the minimal your walkaway valuation is uh, 2.6 is 35 percent of seven is it 35 percent of seven or something I'm just throwing a number out there some point whatever so seven point whatever minus 2.6 that's your walkaway pre-money valuation so probably 4.8 is your walkaway like less than that bad deal so you start haggling towards that you say I want to To raise at seven pre money or at eight pre money and then they will slowly haggle you down to five or six you got a deal for 2.6 it's a normal deal if you want to raise 400k you want to be diluted by 35 percent on the other hand 400 out of 2.6 is one seventh approximately less a little bit a little bit uh, more than one seventh one seventh of 35 percent is five percent and The person investing 400 doesn't want to take five percent for 400 that person wants to take 10 or 15 percent right it's investing at more of a risk he doesn't know if you will reach that milestone so let's say we say 15 percent so 15 percent multiply four by 6.2 400 by 6.2 that's about 2.5 2.5 minus 400 your free money is 2.1 okay for that round of financing that's the walk away free money like the if you get less than that bad deal Okay, I would say 1.8 is a bad deal for 400. So that's the calculation. How much money do I need? What's my walk away? What's a reasonable dilution? And then haggle from above that. Like start your a- anchor from above that, from 20% above that. So, so based on that, the founders is in a better position to pay the weight of the price of all the money. I recommend to raise in increments. Like if people throw a lot of money at you, you should, there's something to worry about. I mean, there's, you, you, there's it. Yeah, I mean, raise in increments, but raise more money than you need. So if you, if you say, I need 300 to reach the milestone, then yeah, yeah raise 375, okay? But if you need 2.6 and someone's throwing five at you, I would be cautious, okay? So then there's a term sheet. After the term sheet is signed, you negotiate transaction documents. It's like the long share purchase agreement articles of association. You sign them, and then there's a closing. It's the money in the bank. Let's talk about time periods. What's the time period between here and here in, in your experience? Between where and where? Good meeting and term sheet. I mean, some people date the investors for months. Yep. You know? yep. So it can be between, it will either be 
Straight between away. zero and one week. Yeah. If you're like hot, 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 usually only applicable to repeat entrepreneurs who've sold their company and people want in. And then if it's not that, it can be one and a half to three months. Okay? So you're saying like that's a term sheet or a draft term sheet? So the draft term sheet. Right. Sign term, draft term sheet to sign term sheet should not take more than a week or a week and a half. If it's taking more than a week and a half, it, uh, it's too litigious. Um, maybe two. So, so it's like a holiday or some shit. So that's <laughs> term sheet. Because no, investors take holidays. They have like, they have fishing trips. You can't do a term sheet when they're on a fishing trip. So they're like, it doesn't matter that your girlfriend is going to leave you because you don't have a real job and your mother hates you. It doesn't matter. The term sheet is a fishing trip. So then you're negotiating transaction documents. How long does that take? On average, this one's more scientific, 30 to 60 days. And then there's the signing to closing. Now, signing transaction documents, money in the bank. Shouldn't this be like a day away? Well, not always. The thing is that investors are always buying time. They're buying time because the odds are against you. And they can conduct a business due diligence throughout the entire process while you're running out of money and air. Okay? So in this period... If you've got a lot of term sheets going on, which is my recommendation, try to get as many alternatives at your disposal as possible. Always work on alternatives. Don't let an investor that's flirting heavily with you make you feel like you're the only one in the world. Just work on alternatives all the time. That will get you faster to a term sheet and faster past this phase. Throughout this entire period, regulations might change. Your personal uh, status might change. The personal status of your founders might change, uh, of your co-founders. And the status of the investors that you're talking with might change due to global market crises, etc. Okay? So you need to get past this phase as quickly as possible. And the best way to do that is to generate alternatives. Any alternatives, even if almost fictional. Someone likes me. So just say, I'm negotiating <laughs> with other people. It's important. Because they have a big FOMO, right? They don't yeah. want to miss out. Yeah. So that's that. This period right here, oh my God, this is no sleep zone. Because here, you're hot. You just signed the term sheet, you signed the term sheet, and now you know that the, this deal, it's going to turn into a deal for 90, at 95%. 95% of term sheets turn into a deal, okay? The investor doesn't want to lose a deal after he starts a term sheet. But during the 30 to 60 day period where lawyers are drafting these meticulous documents and are conducting a nasty due diligence process on your company, legal due diligence process, that neither of them should actually risk the deal during this period, you're in a no shop. You cannot look for other investors according to most term sheets, right? Most term sheets have a no shop. So you're hot, you're amazing, but you're off the market and you're running out of money and you're at the whims of lawyers, not even of the investor. So it's, you want to get that deal. You want to be like a, like a military general in that process and just push it along as fast as possible. And then throughout this entire period, there's a due diligence being conducted and the due diligence will spawn a lot of things that you have to fix up that you didn't clean up beforehand. Like, for example, you engaged an advisor and then you fired the advisor and you didn't get a proper waiver of claims. The lawyers here might feel like you need to get that waiver of claims. You started working on your startup whilst being employed by another company. A lot of founders do that. You didn't get a waiver from that company with respect to your startup, naming your startup, describing it and saying, you can go do that. We won't sue you. Your investors might want you to go get that approval now and that company might not want to give it to you. Is that what you're trying to no, no, no. It depends on your employment contract with the startup. You must get your lawyers to review the employment contract with the company that you're working with and to tell you what the risks are. Even if you can decide for yourself, oh, these are different fields and this clearly breaches my uh, freedom of occupation, which is constitutional, they will never be able to enforce this against me. Bullshit. It doesn't matter. Your investor does not want to be in a place where the company that it just invested in got an angry letter from a big multinational. It doesn't matter if it's enforceable or not. That investor doesn't want even $10,000 to be spent on answering that letter, right? That's the risk analysis, not the enforceability of uh, your limitations on your freedom of occupation. That doesn't, ex it's not going to exist, that discussion. Why not? So when they come up with these issues, they're going to say, yeah, we'll sign the transaction documents, but we will wire after you clean all your crap up, which happens here. And that can take between a couple of days and a couple of weeks or a month, or sometimes it, this is what kind of kills the deal sometimes. So there you have it guys, that is part one of two of this particular episode with Nimrod Vroman, the partner of Yagalano and Co. 
an Israeli law firm over there in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. Uh, I hope you guys got a lot out of that. I know there's a lot of information. It's probably one to even watch or listen to a couple of times. Um, some really, really important stuff in there. Uh, if you are starting a business or looking to get funded at, at any point in the near future. Again, that is just part one. We've got part two coming up next week. We'll be sure to get that out and we go through even more stuff on that episode. We talk about what makes a good team and really round off the pillars of raising money or the correct pillars for raising money. So we're talking about what makes a good team, the actual criteria a lot of investors are looking for, what makes a good CTO or or, a chief technical officer, how to calculate exact equity structures in company deals, the sort of agency problem, how to deal with it and, uh, and how you get around it. And then understanding your TAM, which is the, your total addressable market. So we go over through all those things in the next episode. Definitely encourage you to tune in to make sure you don't miss it. Make sure you subscribe to this podcast. Uh, if you where how whatever platform you're listening on, make sure you subscribe and keep updated. Get on my mailing list on jacksondean.com.au if you don't want to miss any of those episodes. We'll send you out a notification each week and again i'd appreciate the feedback guys so if you found this episode helpful please drop us a line uh on my website jacksondean.com.au or you can uh, hit me up with a direct message on instagram i'm uh, in full transparency trying out a new thing at the moment with social media I uh, obviously run quite a, a large digital marketing agency and I found so far this year by auditing my time, I've literally been on social media more than 10 hours a day at an absolute minimum. And it's not on my own stuff. It's, it's always on, it's on all the socials for all of our clients and so forth, just overseeing the team. But I'm looking to um, try a little bit of a new approach and see how it goes for a couple of weeks. My goal is to go back into serious business building mode and not be on social media a whole lot personally other than for for business. So you're probably not going to see much from me except for once a week. I'm going to try locking in just a Thursday, which is when our podcast is going out and uh, just go on all the socials there. So if you are sending through messages there, I'm probably not going to get to them until Thursday. My goal is to just have a little bit of a detox personally so that I can focus on just building the business a lot more. I'm heading over to Japan. We're doing a little bit of a holiday for two weeks, a business development type holiday where we can just go to a different country, go to a different culture and get a different perspective, get a different sort of mindset on the the whole mission moving forward for social growth media. So that's sort of what I'm up to at the moment. Um, the next time you sort of hear me, I will be over in Japan. Might actually pump out a couple episodes while I'm there just to let you guys know about how good Japan really is. This will be my third time actually heading over there and, and doing some skiing. Uh, so if you've never been, I highly encourage you to pencil that in next year. We're sort of at the end of the season now over there, but I'm not missing this one. Missed the last three seasons in Japan, not missing it again. So I'm heading over there to just uh, sort of relax. Haven't had a holiday in a very long time that's actually been in holiday, but it never will be. As we all know, as business owners, we never actually have a holiday, mentally at least. So we're heading over there just to get a fresh perspective on everything, uh, do a bit of business development, have a bit more of a structured game plan for when we get back. And uh, my goal is to really just get myself off social media um, every single day. I only want to be on it once a week. Personally, you know, I have no choice within the business that we run. Obviously, we're always on social. So it's just going to be good for me to just try and at least get my my personal perspective off 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 all the um, socials so much. Um, if you do want to uh, link up with me on social media, feel free to on Instagram, LinkedIn. They're the main two that I use and now this podcast. So again, if you are listening in, I do appreciate it. I would really appreciate the feedback as well. Let me know what you think of my uh, social media detox go- game plan, how well it's going to go. We're going to find out. Um, but I'm quietly confident that I will be able to figure out how to how to pull that off with my uh, team taking care of a lot of the heavy lifting nowadays. So uh, that's my goal. 
Again, guys, thanks for listening, and I will see you in the next episode. Last but not least, execution is everything, guys. Remember that. So make sure you go out there and execute something today that you need to get done so that tomorrow looks a whole lot better. Let's get to it, guys, and I will see you in the next episode.